If you define it by its gameplay, the beginner's guide doesn't really have any rules. You know, it's more in the realm of interactive fiction than objective-based gameplay. But if you define it by a critical reception, the first rule of the beginner's guide is that you do not talk about the beginner's guide. It's a game that doesn't want to be written about, according to Laura Hudson's article. Or as game designer Liz England puts it, it resists interpretation. By digging for meaning, we're perilously close to committing its cardinal sin. It instills an uncomfortable self-consciousness in anyone who attempts to look at it for too long, making any inquiring audience uniquely aware of where they're positioning themselves in relation to the game, its narrative, and even, thanks to the game's own developer Davy Reedon's personal introduction and narration, Hi there. Thank you very much for playing The Beginner's Guide. To the developer. As Davy offers, or maybe more accurately imposes, his interpretive voice on this series of short experimental games supposedly created by his estranged friend Coda, we're increasingly dragged into a maze of authorial intent and creative liberty, as well as entitlement and consent. And when it comes to the issue of imposing your interpretation on things, some of us might have more to, to worry about than others. But whether you consider your role to be a player, a fan, an academic, a critic, a friend, the game ignites this little flame of worry. Is this about me? Developer Robert Yang even speculated that they may be the mysterious coder, although admittedly as a rhetorical device rather than a serious consideration. A way of, as they said, bringing their own shit to the table. But as much as I might think I hear the game tutting admonishingly at me for trying to interpret its meaning, and then for that tutting to only grow ever louder as I realise that to even think that is itself an interpretation… <laughs> no. You're not gonna trap me that easily. It's far too early in the video for a performative breakdown. I'm standing on the shoulders of every other writer's personal crisis with this game, and no one needs another one. And. I actually don't feel like I need to tread too carefully with the beginner's guide. After all, it's just a game. But what makes this game so slippery are the questions it repeatedly raises around what is and isn't accessible and acceptable when we're bringing our own shit to the table. I want us to see past the games themselves. I want to get to know who this human being really is. And that's exactly what we're going to do here. Stripped down to their most basic formula, games are about either allowing or denying access. You do good, you get more game. You do bad, and you may never get past level 4 of Geometry Dash. And by you, I mean me. And while access to other media may be limited by availability or because it's so long or difficult, it's not like a book is going to find your reading performance lacking and be like, no, no more book for you. So the relationship between player and game can be thought of as playfully antagonistic. Because even when games might deny us access, that doesn't mean we can't force our way in. From watching Let's Plays to creating modified versions of a game, the ability to break in and root around is unique to the construction of video games, allowing us to go places we were never meant to go, see things we were never intended to see, even if just vicariously. There are even games built around this function. Jastronauts is a mod of Gary's mod, which is itself a mod of Half-Life 2, and in it you break into the maps and levels of other games, steal their props, and obviously sell them to your interdimensional cat overlords. You can even steal walls and floors, and when missing assets return error messages, you can steal those too. What feels transgressive here is taking control of something we were supposed to be subservient to. But at what point does this gratuitous freedom begin to feel hollow? Part of what makes Jastronauts feel transgressive is that, despite being this ungoverned utopia where our greedy, thieving hearts can frolic with abandon, it's actually one of the most inaccessible games to even try to play. I mean, I haven't played it. You need to install not only the game, but also Gary's mod and realistically a number of Source Engine games like Half-Life 2, Portal, Counter-Strike. I don't have any of those things. And sure, I could get them, but eh. And even if you have the time, money, or resources to get something working, that's the accessibility barrier we can face in almost any aspect of life. Effort. 
but from the opening of the beginner's guide, Davy is committed to making coders games accessible to us. Not only in terms of sharing them and explaining them, but also in removing any friction from the experience. Anything that we might have found boring or difficult, Davy modifies the game so we can just skip past it. Like this prison cell that's supposed to keep you trapped for an hour. Nah. And maybe you think that if you haven't virtually sat in that prison cell for an hour, then you haven't only cheated the game, you've cheated yourself. But I think in practice most of us were relieved. And even though knowing isn't the same as experiencing, you could argue that, at least in the case of video games, they're both legitimate modes of interaction. Robert Yang, again, who you may remember as Not Coder, wrote Not a Manifesto on games as conceptual or performance art, saying that for the vast majority of the world, my games live as thought experiments or imagined games, and that the most important thing about a game is that you can think about it. Which positions this hypothetical experience as not equal to, but still equally valid as the played experience. But the issue with this prison door, these modifications Davy makes to the games, what he deems important and unimportant to our experience and to his interpretation, is the implication it might have on broader discourse. Like, skipping over or modifying things as is convenient to us is maybe where those of us who are writing off the back of other people's work can start to feel so attacked right now. And as Davy's narration in the Beginner's Guide reveals that while he's supposedly talking about these games, he's only really thinking about himself, it's only natural that anyone talking about the Beginner's Guide will be cautious of committing this cardinal sin. Like, the energy we're all bringing here is Robert A. Heinlein's assessment of writing, that it's not necessarily something to be ashamed of, but do it in private and wash your hands afterwards. But I don't think analysis needs to be a conclusive and didactic account of what something really means. This isn't about the artist's intentions. This is about me ransacking their work for tantalizing entry points into wider social and philosophical conversations and then selling them to my interdimensional cat overlords. We're all aware of this. And it's a practice that I think is either a useful adventure in anthropology or at worst for the lols. Like, it's a game, right? It's harmless. But if that's true, why do I still feel so uncomfortable? Something the beginner's guide demonstrates frighteningly well is that you can think you're in one place and suddenly find you're someplace else. Like, whenever I talk about games, I get a lot more complaints about spoilers than I do on videos about other media. I assume, because of a comparative lack of essay writing on games, many click these videos mistaking them for reviews. If someone's in a review mindset, it might not immediately occur to them that a video on the beginner's guide might contain spoilers for the beginner's guide. So, spoiler alert, it, it does. Because we likely assume that what we're told at the start of the game is true. That this is game designer Davy Reardon, creator of the Stanley Parable, and that these games we're introduced to were made by his friend Coda. But at some point, something starts to feel off. And probably before the end of the game, you realise that despite sharing his name and voice, Davy is not Davy Reardon. These aren't his friend's games. That we're not experiencing a technical demonstration, but a work of fiction. And it uses the framework of game design and analysis to discuss a much more destructive and harmful kind of imposition. Moving from academic and creative curiosity to personal violation. What makes us uncomfortable is that we're standing in the doorway of what's acceptable and unacceptable, and suddenly we can't quite be sure which side of the door we're on. Because Davy's commitment to accessibility goes beyond the negation of effort or boredom. He personally welcomes players to games that were seemingly never intended for public release and even offers his email address. You can email me at d-a-v-e-y-w-r-e-d-e-n at gmail.com. That this unfailing openness points to a belief that everything and everyone should be accessible. Always. Throughout the game, Davy picks at the boundary between the creator and their work, and even if we conclude that they are of course not one and the same, because Davy so often conflates and confuses the two, breaking into a game can begin to feel like breaking into a person. 
The trailer for the game is literally logging into a computer and rifling through someone else's hard drive. And despite the nonchalant manner in which it's presented, there's no way that isn't a violation of privacy. The relationship that most immediately comes to mind here is that of the artist and their audience, or fans. Particularly the entitlement fans might feel towards creative works and the people who make them. Laura Hudson commented that there's a sense that Coda's games are neither as accessible or transparent as Davey would prefer, as though something owed has not quite been delivered. And so Davey continues to demand more of these games, and more of Coda. I'd like this collection to reach him, to maybe encourage him to start creating again. And if the people like you who play this also happen to find his work interesting, then I'm sure it'll just send that much stronger of a message of encouragement to Coda. Wanting the games to be accessible, as in playable or understandable, gives way to Davey's desire for Coda to be accessible. Hypothetically speaking, Diana Fuss writes that every identification involves a degree of symbolic violence, a measure of temporary mastery and possession. But extreme fandom holds mastery and possession at its core, what Rishi and Kibbard calls an untenable love which demands control. And I think our tendency to make ourselves the protagonist of not only our own story, but also everyone else's, leads many an audience to impose their own desires on both creative works and the people behind them, even under the guise of encouragement. But this tendency isn't limited to the impersonal dynamic of artist and audience. After all, Davy and Coda were friends. And even with the ever-creeping influence of the parasocial forever blurring the line between friend and stranger, a relationship doesn't have to be one-sided to be mediated in some way. Davy admits to using Coda's games as a kind of intimacy shortcut. That I could just play someone's game and see the voices in their head and get to know them better and have to do less of the messy in-person socializing? I could just get to know you through your work. Only it's maybe more of the straying from the path, no, I swear it's just through these trees, have we passed this rock before? Kind of shortcut. Because Davy ends up making a lot of assumptions about Coda's intentions and mental state that we learn were inaccurate projections. And building imagined narratives around other people's actions doesn't require something as involved as them making games you can play. I think in general, humans' affinity for storytelling means we can construct these same narratives from the most mundane interactions, the amateur sleuths of our own relationships. But the thing with self-constructed stories is that it's hard not to make yourself the lead, even when you know you shouldn't. Davy senses himself in Coda's life right up to the end of the game. I'm the reason that you stopped making games, aren't I? Even though we don't actually know that Coda did stop making games, only that he stopped showing them to Davy. But for Davy, if he's been forced out of the narrative, that must mean the story is over, because he can't imagine a story continuing without him. It's hard to imagine the stories that exist without us. Even if, at least intellectually, we all know they do. Even Davy knows. His interpretation of the fifth game, of discovering the hidden labyrinth behind this level's walls, is essentially that very concept. I think that the point is the same, is that most of the time you don't get to know what you're missing, or even that you're missing anything. Wow, what a neat idea. That doesn't have any practical application in my life at all. In this New York Times article, now also available as a meme, Tim Crider wrote that there's something existentially alarming about finding out how little room we occupy and how little allegiance we command in other people's heads. Because there's a difference between knowing something, like intellectually, and knowing something, emotionally, really feeling and understanding it. Metaphorically, this is the gap between the idea of waiting an hour for a door to open and the experience of waiting an hour for a door to open. Two things that might be equally valid in the sandpit of philosophy, but grow further and further apart if we think about that concept practically. Like, of course we know that not everyone will always view our actions favourably, but when someone accidentally hits reply rather than forward on an email that details their exact exasperation and disdain over your rented herd of goats, that's when you really know. We know there are things that aren't for us, but the beginner's guide can really make you feel it. 
The seventh game sees the return of a puzzle Davy solved for us previously, so when asked by the characters on the other side of the puzzle door how I solved it, the most honest response was that I didn't. Someone else let me in. And suddenly I felt like I was somewhere I wasn't supposed to be. A lot of Coders games require cheating to progress. Whether it's not keeping your eyes closed when you're told to, or Davy opening a door that is straight up impossible for us to open as a player. The Beginner's Guide repeatedly presents us with boundaries we're asked not to cross. So, as Davy asks regarding the Hidden Labyrinth... So if your role here is not to understand, then what is it? Well, I think it's the idea of understanding that can be approached differently to how Davy presents it. Davy's model of understanding is all about knowing, about puzzles and solutions, about unlimited access. But understanding is also about respect, that maybe sometimes our role is to respect that which we cannot know. We Are Here Because of Those That Are Not is an interactive artwork by Danielle Braithwaite Shirley, a digital archive of black trans history which asks us to be honest with the archive meaning that whatever lies behind the options for black or trans people is not for me to know as a white cis person. It's not for me to take. Respecting that boundary isn't just about content in a video game, but reflects the struggle black trans people face in establishing their own voices in a system that continues to erase them, encouraging us to speak up for marginalized communities without talking over them. For white cis people, understanding isn't about accessing everything the game has to offer, but respecting what is asked of us. And the beginner's guide also works to create the experience of how it feels to not be able to speak for yourself. The way Davy drags us through these games doesn't just negate our effort, but also our agency. In the fourth game, Davy does allow you to speed through this decelerated climb, but if you choose not to, you'll still be moving just as slowly when you reach the top. So here I am, crawling around the room, like a sucker, trying to read this when- Damn it, Davy! But through Davy's actions, we also witness loss of control, not as the result of someone else, but from a more abstract internal force. Like fear, love, ambition. Davy can begin to feel like that subconscious part of the self, giving a voice to those intrusive thoughts. In one way, he embodies that pressure to be accessible and available, how it applies not only to how we might demand too much of someone else, but also the obligation we might feel to give too much of ourselves. We can read this in the context it's presented in, of video game development or any creative work, in the introduction to his collection of essays, Tell Them I Said No, Martin Herbert writes, A big part of the artist's role now is showing up to self-market. Being present. On all channels, ideally. All gates open. But I don't think this is unique to artists. When it comes to how much we want to offer of ourselves, everyone can stand to know their limits, even when upholding those boundaries isn't going to be easy. As artist Mariana Simnet said of fellow artist Julia Phillips, it's powerful and no doubt hard work to be the one saying no all the time. And if Davy has an internal voice, another Davy star narrator of his own actions, I think that voice is defined by a deep sense of self-loathing. That's his abstract internal force. And it's just as important and just as difficult to say no to those forces too. It was that I needed to see myself in someone else. I needed to be someone other than me. I'm afraid that I did something really stupid because I don't like myself. I think it's natural to want to get things right with an interpretation, to do things well, to hold up your experience to the game saying, is this it? Does this please you? And for the game to say, yes, my child, you are a good player. But the beginner's guide couldn't make this more difficult. It presents us with material ripe for analysis, and then when we try to analyze it, seems to say, no, bad audience. But, and this isn't the first time I've admired our somehow very human need to make meaning from things, it's honestly adorable. As much as this game isn't about me, this video isn't really about you, game. In writing about his memification, Timothy Crider, the goat herd guy, quoted cartoonist Linda Barry in saying, it's the artist's job to bring 50% to a work of art. 
the audience supplies the other 50%. But the funny thing is, maybe us games writers were so busy bringing our own shit to the table that while we were saying this isn't about us, we missed the fact that it maybe really isn't about us. Or at least the story doesn't end with us. It's not necessarily about game interpretation, but is just partly using that as a lens through which to explore personal relationships and broader impulses as a way of bringing their own shit to the- okay, I've used that phrase too much now. But seeing yourself reflected in something is equally an opportunity for self-reflection. And playing the beginner's guides, I don't think we can help but feel self-conscious. Whether it's for how we play games, how we talk about art, or how we treat the people we know and don't know. The awkwardness with which everyone talks about this game demonstrates how we're encouraged to reassess our behaviour the effect it might be having on other people, or even ourselves. And ultimately, I think this game gets us to keep asking a really important question. Should I be doing this? You think you know me, you don't know me well at all. You think you know me, you don't know me well at all. You think you know